Okay. Well, good evening, everyone. Um, I like how Shoshana often says the date. So it is January 16th, 2024. This is Becky Schmooze. Um, and we're so glad that we have Sammy Grover here with us tonight. Um, from warmer, he told us, but not that much warmer, uh, North Carolina, um, where his school district uh, just announced a two-hour delay for tomorrow, just to give you a sense of the temperature. Uh, so I think we're, you know, we're likely all on a similar boat here. Um, but it is a, you know, a night where we're thinking about not just the temperature, but our climate. Um, and that's what Sammy is in many ways here to, to talk about. Uh, I'll just briefly introduce him um, and then really turn things over for what I know will be a really a conversation, uh, you know, that we'll have plenty of time for questions and answers and open discussion, maybe questions in both directions. Um, but for those of you that didn't, you know, read up on um, Sammy, um, I'll give you a little bit of a rundown and more so just say that um, actually uh, I really got to know Sammy's work through uh, Rabbi Woodward, um, who it's great to have here tonight, um, because on the first day of Rosh Hashanah, um, Rabbi Eric spoke about um, really the themes of Sammy's book and mentioned uh, it by name, um, by the way, I'll mention it by name now, we are all climate hypocrites now, how embracing our imperfections can unlock the power of a movement. Um, I feel like we're going to witness like a great friendship form, because I think that a lot of the, like, it was a very Rabbi Eric sermon. And it was a very, I mean, it's very infused with Sammy Grover and what he had to say, right, how we can embrace imperfection, and yet move forward, um, feels like a very Rabbi Eric message. And yet that's actually the core of what Sammy wrote. Um, so he is, um, also a prolific writer, um, and doesn't just write a wonderful book a couple of years ago, um, but has tons and tons of articles on, um, treehugger.com and maybe many other sites. So I will say, Sammy, that's where I've seen most of your work. Um, and he's just overall a thinker on how we brand projects, how we brand products or ideas, um, and does a lot of that work on a daily basis and thinks frequently about how that affects climate. So Sammy, I hope you I've done you justice and can tee you up um, for a conversation. We're so glad to have you. Thank you. Done me more than justice. It's um, hopefully we're not overselling and under delivering, but um, we'll, we'll see what we can do. <laughs> so th thank you. Um, and I'll just start by saying, um, Rabbi Wood, I read your sermon. Um, I sent it to my mother. She was very proud. It was an excellent sermon. It was probably one of the best summaries I've read, or when I say best, one of the one of the pieces of writing about the book that was closest to what I was trying to get to with with the the with the writing of it. So I, I really appreciated it. It was nice. Um, nobody gets rich or famous writing a book like that, but it's really nice when it lands with somebody and sort of hits hits where you were trying to go. So um, that that was just sort of my my initial just thank you, thank you for making me look good to my mother. That's always helpful. Um, <clears throat> I was, I don't have a long presentation planned. Um, I was going to spend sort of five, 10 minutes, just a little bit of background on me and, and where I'm, where I'm coming from, how I came to the questions I sort of grapple with. Um, I don't present myself as an authority on climate policy, climate action. What I present myself as an authority on is being an imperfect person trying to do the best I can. Um, and largely that seems to be every other person I meet on this planet seems to be in the same boat. So I think it's a useful place to start. Um, before I do that, just I, just a sort of quick show of hands maybe is that like my, I think I know this already from the discussion that's already happened, but just in terms of folks, it sounds like everybody's fairly sort of at least in tune with the idea of the climate crisis, thinks about the climate crisis, concerned about the climate crisis um, and has some level of action on the climate crisis, right? That seems like where we're at. So we don't need to spend too much time um, sort of getting into whether it exists or not and all that crap, because who has the time for that? Um, so, so let me give you a little bit of background. So I'm obviously not from North Carolina originally. I'm from Southwest England. Um, my wife tells me I'm losing the accent, which is trouble because it's all I've got going for me. Um, she's threatening me with divorce, but, um, I take out the trash too. We'll be fine. Um, but I, so I've been involved in climate activism since I was about 13, 14 years old. Um, I'm now no longer 13 or 14 years old. Um, 
I used to be involved with sort of protest groups, local Friends of the Earth group, that kind of thing. Um, attending kind of back in the 90s in England, there was a lot of activism around road building, um, trying to prevent uh, the, the conservative government at the time sort of expanding the, the, the motorway system, essentially the highway system. Um, so I got involved there very, very early on. Student days also involved in activism. But, but a lot of what I found myself gravitating towards was essentially lifestyle change. Right. Because those big questions of how do you stop a road being built? How do you turn around a, a government's energy policy or whatever? Those are long term questions and they get really frustrating when you're not seeing progress. So so rather than sort of focusing on those areas where it felt like I was sort of bashing up against a brick wall, I found myself moving to, well, how can I grow my own vegetables, you know? How can I reduce the amount of meat I'm eating? Um, and that led me at one point to to essentially pledge to never fly again. Um, the universe being what it is, I had one last flight to take across the Atlantic for for work. And on that work trip, I met my wife um, and I've been living in the States, flying regularly, feeling guilty about it ever since. Um, I, I bring all that up just to say, like, lifestyle change is hard beyond a certain point. Um, it becomes harder and harder to sort of shrink your footprint from whatever it is, 15 tons, 20 tons, 25 tons of carbon, whatever, whatever, whatever your footprint is. There's, there's low hanging fruit that we can all do and probably should do, but beyond a certain point, it becomes harder and harder to shrink yourself to nothing. Right. Um, and, and even if you get to nothing, there's nowhere to go from there. Right. And I kept running into people who were, who were sort of struggling with this same problem, right? I remember distinctly in my early 20s sitting in the dark because I didn't want to have the lights on because I just felt like, you know, well, that, that's connected to coal. So I'd sit there with a hand crank radio listening to, uh, listening to the equivalent of NPR. Um, and that's a pretty sad scene, right? I quickly discovered that the pub over the road had the lights on anyway, so it was fine. I just went there. Um, <coughs> I mean, I, I ran a youth workshop two years ago at a local sort of youth climate conference. So co co-led it with a young young man who was talking about the same thing. He um, stopped riding on roller coasters when he went to theme parks with his friends because he, he knew that those roller coasters were running on electricity and he didn't feel like he could possibly justify getting on a roller coaster. And I, I kind of had to put my foot down and say, like, if, if we're not going to have fun, then what's the point? What are we trying to preserve? Right. Um, so, so that was kind of the initial starting point for the book is, is recognizing that there was this limitation to how far you can go with individual action and starting to think about what else might make sense to, to pay attention to. Um, and I thought it was going to be a debunking of the idea that individual action mattered at all. That was kind of my starting point. Um, and what I realized was that that didn't really resonate with me either because I was continuing to do these things. I was arguing that we needed systemic change. We needed a political change. We needed all of this. And yet I was going out on my evening walks and I was picking up trash and I was biking to the library and I was doing all of these things. Um, and yet I hear from a certain crowd of activists that would say, well, 100, I don't know if you all have heard the statistics sort of raise your hands if you have, but 100 companies are responsible for 90% of the emissions on the planet or something like that. And it's all the corporations and we must take on the corporations, right? That is a, a commonly touted rhetoric, but that felt just as sort of um, reductive as this idea that it's all on me, right? It felt like there's gotta be a middle ground between it's all on me and I've got to do all I can as an individual. I'm responsible for all the weight of the world or it's all on shell oil over there. Somewhere in the middle is this place of we're all in this system and we all have a role to play in shifting the system towards a greener trajectory. And where that really leads me to is just this idea that individual action matters, but it matters for slightly different reasons than we've been told. The metric where we're looking at is not necessarily what is my carbon footprint, right? What is my 10 tons, 11 tons, 12 tons? The metric I end up landing on instead is sort of what is the contribution I am making to moving us in the right direction? And some of that happens exactly through individual action. The choices I make at the grocery store influence what the farmer grows down the road or what the grocery chooses to stock. Um, it also influences when I make it, you know, make dinner for friends. It influences what they're going to eat, right? Um, <clears throat> if you look at consumer action, this, this specifically here talking about sort of what we do or don't buy. Boycotts have been hugely influential in various sort of social justice issues over the years, right? If you look at um, the fight against apartheid in South Africa, 
consumer boycotts were really valuable, but they were organized consumer boycotts. And that's where I try and push people more towards is this idea of how do we collective, how do we bring our individual action into collective power, right? So if we're riding a bike, how do we find other people who are riding their bikes and come together to start pushing for, you know, bike lanes in New Haven, right? Or if we're, you know, if we're working on recycling, how do we bring in our congregation, you know, and, and start working on recycling at the synagogue level, right? And then how does the synagogue talk to the church down the road or the community center or the mosque or whatever, right? How do we move with ripples outwards into the world? It's sort of the, the task I've been sort of grappling with. Um, <clears throat> and there's a couple of reasons why that's valuable, right? One, I think it's the most effective way to spend our time. Because, like I said, there's a, there's a re diminishing return on investment as you start to tackle the low-hanging fruit of your own footprint. But there's, in theory at least, a limitless amount you can go outwards into the world. There's a limitless amount of influence you can have. Um, the second thing I find it helps me with is this idea of, of guilt, right? Is that if you have, I, I don't know how many people feel guilty about, you know, um, outsized carbon footprints or consumption or all of those things. I knew, this was the other thing that I thought I was going to be doing when I wrote the book. I thought I was going to dismiss the idea of guilt, get rid of it, right? We don't need to feel guilty. We can move on and just focus on action. And actually what I found is guilt is really useful. I've decided to sort of embrace my guilt, but also keep it in its place, right? Where I've landed is that guilt is actually, and I think this was one of the things I loved about your sermon, Rabbi, is that the, you know, this idea of, of guilt being this sort of place, that's where there's a tension between my values and what I'm doing. And it just, it's just sort of like that little, I mean, it's, you know, it's a cliche, right, of that little like voice on your shoulder, but it's essentially that. And what it pushes you to say is like, okay, I feel guilty because I have, you know, I have a higher than globally average lifestyle, right? Higher than globally average level of wealth. I probably do have some outsized responsibility to do something about it. And I think guilt to that degree is useful, um, but where it's not so useful is in telling me what I should actually do. And this is true on a whole bunch of social issues, right? If I feel guilty about my wealth, what that guilt is going to tell me to do is, you know, give money away really ostentatiously and make it sort of make it a, a show of generosity, right? That's not necessarily the best way of spending my time trying to eliminate poverty. It might be my best time is, is going out and talking to my elected representatives. And the same is true of climate, right? Is that if I allow the guilt to guide what I actually do, then I'm probably going to do those ostentatious things. I'm never going to fly again. I'm going to, you know, go live in a yurt and poop in a bucket or whatever it is, right? And that's not necessarily the most productive use of my time. Now, there are people doing that and doing great work doing that, but 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 it's not going to work for everybody, right? The example I use is sort of actually in the fight against racism, right? Is that I think a lot of guilt is a really useful push for people to do something about institutional racism, um, but often because guilt then is such a driver where we end up landing is the um, performative aspects, right? A yard sign goes up in your, in your yard and you, you know, you get the t-shirt and you, you know, you make your donations and then you move on. It becomes more about absolution than it is actually sort of working towards solutions. I, I still can't decide if that's a really good rhyme or a really cheesy rhyme, but um, <clears throat> so two more points and then I will open it up to discussion, but um Related to guilt, the other area I sort of explore in the book is shame. Now, guilt and shame, there are various different definitions out there, and I'm not a psychologist or a sociologist, so forgive me. Um, I think a lot of people use Brene Brown's um, definitions around shame, um, and shame has a bad rap, right? Who I actually spoke to in the book um, is a lady called Jennifer Jackway. She wrote a book called Is Shame Necessary? So alongside this idea that we we're going to get rid of guilt, the other part I thought was we we're going to get rid of shame. Like, let's stop pointing fingers let's stop accusing other people of being hypocrites and you know accusing other people of not be doing enough and let's move on from that um and her book kind of flipped me 180 on 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 that that idea she actually argues that shame is a really really important social tool always has been in every culture um and it's actually a form of social regulation the problem with shame is that it only works in a to a certain degree right shame is extremely powerful but the more you use it the more you dilute its power. So shame tends to work around the edges of social norms, right? So if the, the example she used in the book that, that really stuck with me is if you'll remember in the 80s, kind of the, the anti-fur campaigns, 
they were extremely effective in the an animal rights world. And they were essentially a shaming function, but they worked because most people weren't walking around wearing fur, right? So it was, it was an opportunity to sideline or hold up particularly egregious overconsumption. And it allowed everybody else's um, so, sort of moral center to shift at the same time. Right? And actually, shame works in the same way. If we walk around shaming each other for every time we fail to put the screw cap on that, um, you know, on the Tetra Pak carton that you're throwing in the recycling, right? Or, um, you know, you've got the person who doesn't fly shaming somebody else because they did, and that person shaming them back because they're not a vegan, and somebody else is over here saying, well, I don't have a car, and you're the one to blame. That becomes a circular firing squad, and it's not getting us anywhere, right? But if we can use shame tactically and it might be different for different people so for example in the uk there was quite effective campaigns around suvs because suvs hadn't yet taken over in the same way as they had in the states and they don't make as much sense on a london street right so there was some really interesting sort of brand branding around suvs where essentially activists named them chelsea tractors and sort of um, it, it, there, and, and it worked within that context. It became socially unacceptable to drive a car like that within those streets. But here where most of my coworkers, most of my friends are driving a larger car, it would be pointless. And I, I would consider it immoral to point the finger in the same way. Um, final point and then uh, question. So, so one other term I would like to introduce you to um, Hopefully that makes sense so far. And please feel free to interrupt if there's any questions on, on any of this. But, but the last um, term I was going to introduce you to was, is a really fascinating one. So you'll, you'll have heard of the carbon footprint, right? Being essentially um, a calculation you can do to, to measure the emissions related to your own lifestyle, or it can be the carbon footprint of a specific product or whatever else. Um, there are a group of social researchers in Finland um, who came up with the term carbon handprint. And I think it's a really useful countermeasure to the carbon footprint. And the idea of the carbon handprint is to measure your positive climate impact. And I would argue both are important. There is a lot of value in a carbon footprint for certain purposes, but a carbon handprint to me feels far more powerful and far more important than a carbon footprint. Now, obviously they're also related, right? Is that if you have an outsized carbon footprint, it's gonna counteract more of your carbon handprint. So nothing I say in the book or nothing I argue for in the book or here hopefully comes across as the idea that you don't have to worry about your emissions. You don't have to worry about your consumption. We all have to worry about those things to a certain degree. Um, the more we can get our carbon footprint down, the further ahead we'll be with our carbon handprint. But I tend to argue sort of it's a, it's a, nine, uh, a 2080 kind of a problem. Spend 20% of your time figuring out some things you can do on your carbon footprint. And probably at some point you'll start hitting up against it either because of systemic reasons. Hey, I can't ride my bike because, you know, Durham city council is awful and I will die. Um, or, you know, I can't stop eating meat because I really, really like steak. Um, and both of those things, both of those things I, I argue are valid, right? We all have places where we're going to find it harder for systemic reasons. And we're also probably going to have places where we're going to find it harder because what, Somebody is going to say is a moral failing. I think it's a reality of being human. Um, I'm in danger of going on to one more tangent. So if you will indulge me um, for a second. Um, the last tangent I will go on, because it just reminded me of this, in terms of the moral failings um, that other people will point towards. I interviewed a woman in the book called Zakia McKenzie. She's, uh, she's based in Bristol, which is my old hometown in England. Um, we connected because we both like Marmite. Um, and we just had this long conversation on what used to be Twitter about Marmite. Um, but she talks a lot about um, flying. Um, she is a uh, black woman of Jamaican descent living in England. And she said she kept running into English environmental activists who said it's immoral to fly, it's immoral to fly, it's immoral to fly. And she said nine times out of 10, it would be an old white guy who would say, I'm really glad I, glad I got my flying done when I was young and it was still okay, right? And Zakia has family in New York. She has family in Kingston, Jamaica. And honestly, she has to put up with English rain, right? So we, we connected on this idea of, you know, not flying is harder for some people than it is for others. You know, stopping eating meat is harder for some people than it is for others. Stopping driving is harder for some people than it is for others. Everybody is subject to the context they're living in. 
And we have to find this way of being kind to ourselves and each other and really focusing our attention on like, where is my effort going to actually make a difference? Um, where can I support others in moving forward without sort of lapsing into these circular firing squads that just drive me nuts and make environmentalism no fun at all? Um, so uh, forgive me if I, there was there was three more points than I intended to make, but um, hopefully some of it was useful. Um, I was going to throw it out to the group and, you know, if, uh, any comments, questions, happy to answer questions, happy for Happy to sit here and learn from all of you all too. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, first of all, um, thank you, Sammy. Uh, that was wonderful. We could have heard more tangents um, or you know other lessons. Um, you probably I, will. Yeah, no, absolutely. <laughs> you, you know me um, well enough. I mean, yeah, just even uh, in your outset. So thank you. But I um. And I don't know if uh, we sort of provided instructions or anything for people in advance. Um, I actually haven't been to a virtual Zoom schmooze in a little bit, so I'm not sure if we're still using a chat, you know, if you have a question or if people, I think we can probably just raise our hands and unmute. But I'll, I'll start with a, a question and not just instructions or tech notes. Um, one of the things that, uh, it, in, when we had our little prep call um, that Becky and I did with you, um, you were... You know, in between, you were chauffeuring. Um, this is not a car question; it's a kid question. You were um, had your one of your daughters, uh, and I'm curious, you know, uh, how you have engaged your your kids um, in this conversation and education, um, and how you've balanced um, uh, sort of hope and responsibility and fear or realism. Um, if you haven't, I'll, as I ask you that question, I'm going to put in the chat like something you can reference, which it was a, a, a article that I read from your uh, on, on Tree Hugger last month um, about the um, forever forest tradition. Um, oh yeah, I don't know yeah, yeah, yeah. How much that? I forgot to write about that. Yeah. Um, you know how much that uh, sort of ties into like is, is at the core of your your thinking on this or how you've parented and educated yeah it's a really yeah i i struggle with this a lot right because i try not to sugarcoat kind of the situation for my kids my, so for context my kids are now 14 and 12 so one of the things i say to folks when they're talking about this is like age appropriate always right it's the same as when you're talking about the birds and the bees or anything else is like the conversation you have with a six-year-old is going to be different to a 12 year old different to a 14 year old right and and personality specific too so if you have a very anxious child, I think you talk to them differently to, you know, a child that's maybe um, less less prone to sort of the 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 sticks and stones the world throws at us, right? Um, I've I have not sugarcoated the crisis a lot. I tend to tell them that I don't think it looks the science does not look great right now in terms of where we're headed, um, <clears throat> and they're gonna they're gonna have a lot of work to do because the work was not done early enough by other people. Right. That's that's something that I sort of tell them regularly and I tell them it's OK to be pissed off about it. Excuse my language. Um, but also what I try to point them to is that there are so many people working on solutions. Like They would have loved just nerding out on like the the the, the glass in the, the concrete. Right. Is that a lot of this stuff is that it's not that we don't have the solutions. It's not that we don't have the pathways. Right. It's just that we haven't collectively found a way towards enacting them. Um, and then the other part of it is just sort of remembering that, that life is to be lived, right? And the only reason, for, as far as I understand it, the, the earth will be fine with, you know, with or without us. Um, I consider it environmentalism's mission to save or to sustain humanity for as long as possible on this planet, because I like humanity, right? I like, I like the fact we figured out how to make chocolate and punk rock and, you know, all of these things that are just fun and exciting and, uh, bring joy to, to people. Um, so I try to sort of measure any environmental education with just like, hey, you get to be alive on this planet and it's pretty amazing, right? So the 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 um, forever forest idea was just a thing that started years ago. It was really one of my own sort of like, hey, I feel like I should be doing more. So we ended up, we started, I was trying to introduce them to the idea that action builds over time. 
So every holiday, what we do now, every um, we usually do it for their birthdays, but they have a little journal that um, that I, essentially I pay to plant trees. I don't go out and plant trees myself, but I pay to plant trees. Um, and then I've drawn little terribly drawn stick figures of trees in there. And then over the last five, six years, you know, 50 trees has become 100 trees, has become 150 trees, has become 200 trees, right? And so sort of, I'm just trying to introduce them to this idea of sort of small things build over time. Um, and it is, I think it resonates. Uh, you know, one of them's just turned 14, like I said, so there might be some eye rolls soon. And they're like, actually, I wanted an Xbox, you know, but um, it's so so far it seemed to resonate. They are, I'm, I'm blessed with sort of clued in kids who care about this stuff. One of them has started her own little nonprofit where she's raising money for birds and bees and butterflies. And, you know, um, she's, she's done a terrific job doing it. I think they raised $500 one, one year on a yard sale. Um, so really it's sort of, um, Sam, I hope that answers your question. It's sort of the, 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 the balance I try to take is sort of with my kids, it seems appropriate to just sort of pretty much tell it like it is in terms of how I see the science, how I see the politics and then say, here's what's in your control and here's what's not. Right. And then also reminding them they're incredibly lucky compared to, you know, 90 percent. i try well that's also a, a thorny topic on mental health right is that i don't think it's on them that they were born into reasonable comfort i have a distinct memory i think i talk about it in the book I, i'm not sure but um i remember eating english school lunches and they were disgusting i mean beyond disgusting and not not wanting to eat it so i, I sort of took it to the the trash can and i remember a teacher saying to me there there are children starving in ethiopia and and I'm a kid. I'm, my response is great. I don't want this. Can you please send it to them? And that didn't that did not land very well with the teacher, right? But but I remember that I, I still think of that as a very very abusive and unhelpful thing to be teaching a child, right? Um. So so just that measure of like, count your blessings. Understand that you're lucky, but also don't spend your your days sort of beating yourself up about it. Thank you. Uh, I see a hand raised, I yeah. think, Je Jennifer. Hi. Okay. I'm, hey. I'm Jennifer, and um, thank you. I came on about 10 minutes late, so I missed um, kind of your introduction and setup. But, um, you know, I was just thinking that one term that sh should also be in here is solidarity. Um because it seemed like the way you were talking about this was, um, yes, we have to, you know, not get overwhelmed by thinking, you know, we, we're going to do these big things at once. We can work our way towards these steps that are structural. And I feel like we've done that first. We got our electric car. And then we, when we felt like we had a little more money, we could work towards the solar panels on the house and those things. But, you know, we need um, strategies of solidarity in which we're going to work with other groups in our community in order to accomplish structural things, you know. So, for example, right, I may put the solar panels on my house and that's great, but where's the real space? It's on top of all the public school buildings. It's in yes. all the, you know, parking lots. It And so... Um, so I think, first of all, we need to think about solidarity. And so how would you put that into your 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 terms and your formulations here with communities that enable us to achieve things on a structural level, but also solidarity in terms of um, animal populations, because we're the ones who are destroying these habitats and have caused you know, hundreds of thousands of species to go extinct. And I think this is profoundly immoral of us and um, arrogant and, um, uh, uh, you know, we need to find a way to, um, uh, to have them represented in our value system. 100%, I, I, that, that's really helpful. Thank you, Jennifer. I, I think, um, <clears throat> Uh, there's a couple of things that I think is really good about solidarity, right? Like, like this idea of sort of building out and building connections. One, one is just that that's 
again, it's the best way to get to that handprint, right? Is that you, your roof is only so big, as you said, but you've also got, you know, if you can get on the school buildings, if you can get to, you know, community centers or car parks or mun municipal buildings, you start having a much larger impact, right? Um, and actually, there's a great nonprofit. If, if anyone has nonprofits that want to put solar on their roofs, check out a nonprofit called revolve.org. They will help you do it for free um, or for free. Nothing's free. They will help you do it for no money down um, and potentially um, uh, they, they help get around some of the fact that a lot of the tax credits aren't really available to nonprofits. I think some of that might have changed with the, the IRA Act. Um, so so that, that's one thing. But the other thing is that once you start acting in connection with community groups and connection with other affinity groups and in, in connection with other, other individuals, it sort of allows you to get to this place where you can choose your area of primary focus, right? So if I say, like, I'm a compost guy, right? Like, that's my thing. I care about compost. I, I'm going to – I figured out how to compost at home. Now I'm going to figure out composting at my kid's school, and then I'm going to, you know, go out and figure out composting at my workplace. Someone else is over here working on solar panels, right? Someone else is over here working on bike lanes. It's okay for you to take your lead and your lane, but then you still show up when Scotty down the road needs some people to show up for his meeting at the, you know, at the, the town council over bike lanes or when uh, somebody else needs, you know, needs an extra pair of hands to help with that community retrofit or whatever. So just starting to learn that, this is my place to lean in 80% of the time or 80% of my energy. And then also just keeping that eye out for, oh, I can play a supportive role over here. Or maybe I don't have time, but I can, I have money or resources. So just learning to understand that each of us is part of, um, sort of learning to think of the, the climate movement as an ecosystem, if you like, and your role within that ecosystem is really helpful. Um, and I think that also kind of speaks to your your idea of sort of cross species kind of solidarity too, right? Is that learning to cohabit is um, really valuable. Actually, there's a, a guy I just interviewed. There's another a, a book that's a, he's a far more prolific and successful writer than I am, but um, a friend of mine called Stephen Kotler. He wrote a book called Small Furry Prayer. Um, if anyone has if anyone if anyone has pets. Um, this is a terrific book. And so I, I'm, I do have pets because I was bullied into it, but I'm not really, I don't, I don't naturally relate to animals in the same way. Um, I, I believe animals have rights. I believe they're important, but I don't personally sort of have an affinity with animals, but this book blew my mind in terms of the idea of moving from pet ownership to humans and animals have always coexisted, co-evolved. And we need to learn to develop our, um, to design all of our spaces for cohabitation with animals, right? From the micro to the macro. So we build our houses so that our pets are more comfortable. We build our communities so that there's room for biodiversity. We build corridors throughout society, right? That, that needs to be a fundamental building block of design is that how are our, you know, non-human neighbors going to get about? How are they going to survive? What are they going to eat? Right. Sort of shifting that perspective on like, you know, aside from any, and I think you're right, it is a moral imperative, but it's also just self-preservation, right? We, you know, we, we rely on the natural world and we, we can't do without it, you know? So anyway, Small Fairy Prayer by Stephen Kotler, terrific book. Um, almost as good as mine. Um, Sammy, you actually, there was a um, question in the chat that um, oh. it mentioned that might be, you know, relevant to still um, just asking for a little bit more on the carbon handprints, um, which you obviously introduced kind of in your open reference just now, but you just asking for examples of of that or maybe flesh out that concept. A little more. Yeah, so um, I, it's a long time since I read the study that it came from. Um, uh, I'm going to, I'm trying to remember the name of the researchers. Um, I will, as, as we're talking, I will try and find that, that study. Cause it, it had some actual case studies, um, it, or sort of not case studies, but sort of, what would you call them? Sort of personas in marketing, we call them personas where you build out sort of a fictional character that then sort of builds out like what might my carbon hand print look like. Um, I'm going to see if I can pull this up and throw it. 
I'm, my mother is Finnish, so I feel like I should be able to remember the, these uh, researchers' names, and it's Oras Mal or something. <laughs> um, uh, let me see if I've got the right one. No, I'm going down a rabbit hole right now. Um, is there going to be a forum that I can find later? Or if someone has the book in front of them, it's going to be in there. There is a, um, uh, it was a think sweet rabbi. Would you mind like checking the index for me? Um, I think it was, um, it, it was part of a think tank, but essentially what they did is they looked at all the, all the areas of human influence, right? So there was food, transport, uh, home heating, and it sort of really made the collection that made the connection between, um, that is not the original one that I cited, but I'm also not 100% confident that the people I cited were the originators of the term. Um, but it's a fascinating little little report, and I think it was fairly short and fairly unacademic, but it gave you these really good ideas of like, here's these places where you could start on your own footprint, right? Whether it's flight reduction or whatever, and then what might it look like to think differently around changing your workplace travel policies, for example, right? So I've failed miserably at never flying again, but I work for an insurance company that um, one of our biggest carbon outputs is the fact that we fly around the country to see our clients. Um, and one of the things I've been working on is just trying to um, trying to help with, with, with changing our policies so that folks can drive if they want to, or take a train if, haha, we ever get trains in this country. Well, you all are in a part of the world where you, you might actually have trains that vaguely function, but by the way, sorry, I have to mention this, but you all fire your pizza with coal, right? Is that correct? I think a oh. lot, some of them are gas powered. Um... Okay. I, 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 looked that, I looked that up today because I was like, New Haven, I know that's a pizza town, right? It's definitely a pizza town. So they're starting with gas powered now? I was curious. Yeah. I know Sorry, that was, is gas I powered in, in advance? That's ridiculous. Um, and as sorry. Sarah pointed out, there's one pizzeria that's famous for wood. Okay. Fired. Yeah. Still. I was curious. Yeah, I, ju I just saw I saw a, a definition of New Haven pizza as being coal coal fired apparently, and I was like, well, if we if we're going to commit climate crimes, let's do it for deliciousness. Is my view on that. So you know. Um, Sorry, um, uh, I am. I can't find the name in the book. Just if you can remind me, if you remember, yeah. what is that I'm looking for? Here we go. I've found. I got it. Are you ready? I've got. I've got the name of the researchers. Yes. Do you want to try pronouncing them, or should I, Rabbi? Uh, you go for it. Lucy Imbia, Satu Lachten Oya, and Annina Orasma. Um, and that's like I'm fairly confident in that actually, but it's a think tank I'm called impressed. Demos. Um, so if, if you Google, um, carbon handprint and demos, my guess is that would show up. Um, and it, it was a really, I thought it was a really interesting, I'm, I, you know, I wouldn't, uh, I'm sorry, small furry prayer. I can see how it could go small furry prey though. Um, <laughs> yes, that's, um, Stephen Kotler. He's a very, very interesting chap. Um, but he, yes, so he, he uh, the, the story of small furry prayer is that he essentially lives in a pack with 20 special needs chihuahuas and his wife, um, and they'll cohabit, sleep in the same bed together. Um, and his book is his experiences of, of, of that, plus sort of a, a sideline exploration of human, human animal interaction and cohabitation. Um, really from that sort of micro level of how you cohabit successfully through how you design successfully through how you design society successfully for cohabitation. Um, <clears throat> I'm sorry. So I don't, I don't know if that's enough for people to track down the carbon handprint, but essentially it's just this idea of um, uh, measurement through maximum positive climate influence. So the way I think about it is I, you know, I start with, okay, so my carbon footprint is 10, 
10 20 percent lower than um than sort of the us average depending on how i do the math and how generous i am to myself right um and then from there i start looking at like okay well where have i made a difference in my workplace right in terms of helping us reduce our carbon footprint or where have i made a difference in my community or through my writing or that kind of thing it would be sort of an individual carbon handprint calculation obviously it's a lot more fuzzy than a footprint the nice thing with a footprint is like it's fairly defined um, less defined than you think, because there's always an argument. Well, does this, do these emissions belong here, or do they belong to the, you know, are they my emissions or are they are the airline company's emissions? You know, and it really depends on 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 what it is you're trying to measure or what the purpose of the footprint is. Um, yeah, I think that um, I just found, I finally found it in here. Um, it's in the the last chapter, the third footnotes. Um, Pathways to 1.5 degree lifestyles by 2030 in Citra, September 4th, 2020. Um, and uh, yeah, it speaks about that. It, exactly. Um, yeah, I can't pronounce the names any better. Right. Uh, but um, but um, yeah, when I first saw your book, um, I was actually in North Carolina uh, this summer dealing with some stuff from my in clearing out my in-laws house and stuff. And I was at the regulator bookstore in Durham and I had some time to spend. Yeah, and I saw your book and I was like, this looks great. Um, uh, so, oh, you, you know the regulator, great. Because you're in Cor I'm, the, you know, the, the regulator is about um, a 10 minute walk down the road. So next oh, time you're, sure. next yeah, time you're there, oh. I need to buy you a beer or a coffee, so. Yeah, next time, totally. Um, uh, Where is that, in North Carolina? In Durham. Durham, North Carolina. Yeah, it's a great bookshop. Yeah, it really is. Um, it's it's great. Um, but like, I think one of the things, like, just I, one of the things that's like meaningful that was meaningful for me when I read your book, and I, I guess I'm sort of just repeating what what you've said, but was the way that like finding ways to like this sort of handprint communal moments, um, where you can be like, look, we're feeling something similar, and we're connecting, and we feel that isn't just like nothing but that's actually something that's both like important if we want to like actually build a social movement to do the hard work of creating change like we're not going to get there without that um and is also part of like an overall project that we have like there's a lot of things that are interrelated um i also had sort of figured this sermon i, I always sort of struggled with like how to talk about this in a way where it's like, you don't want to make like a giant like fetish out of like one thing, you know, oh, if you do this, you know, then you're fine. Cause like, that's not how anything works in our lives. Um, and then the other hand though, you don't want to just be like, yeah, in fact, don't even do that. It's stupid. It feels <laughs> like that's something else. And so how do you, is there a way to think about these things we do where it's like, oh, they have like a symbolic or a, a meaningful value or even some practical value that might not like, like our actions don't always have to be part of some sort of like grand calculus in order to be actions that are improving things. And um, anyway, I just really enjoyed um, your book that way. Um, yeah. yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you, Rabbi. I, I really, like, I really appreciate it because it's exactly that, right? Is that the, the I think the example, the historical example that kind of blew my mind in the book was the, um, the role of boycotts in the fight against slavery, right? The abolitionist movement is that um, I hadn't realized that consumed, because, you know, I had this glib idea initially. I was like, well, the, the, the slave trade didn't end because people stopped eating sugar, right? It was like, you know, sort of a throwaway line and sort of like I was intending to dismiss consumer activism and all of this. Um, and then I sort of started looking into it. I was like, hold on a minute. Maybe they kind of, they kind of sort of did, but not in the way you'd think, right? Is that actually sugar boycotts were a huge part of the abolitionist movement, right? They were a huge part, but they had a very negligible economic impact, right? So these are these two truths at once. What what sugar boycotts did, is, and again, I'm not a scholar of history. I, I This is sort of other people's work that I'm citing. But my understanding of the situation is that sugar boycotts essentially served as a really accessible starting point, particularly for women who were often making the consumer, per, you know, consumer purchase choices in, in their households. Um, usually higher wealth women um, who did not have the vote, 
right, and did not have um, political clout in the sense in the same way that men did, but they had power over what of consumers over consumer spending. Um, I don't see any, as far as my understanding is, there is no evidence that there was any meaningful drop in sugar sales for sugar derived from slavery um, that hurt the slave, the, the slaveholders. But what it did do is it cast a moral stain on those slaveholders, right? It started to shift uh, societal perceptions over that good, right? Is that if if I will not eat that sugar because it's tainted with blood, then what that is doing is it's shifting this idea of like, well, hey, maybe if it's tainted with blood, we need to start talking about whether this practice of you know kidnapping and murdering entire populations is is okay or not, right? Um, so that to me was like this fascinating place, and I think I think you can. It's obviously it's dangerous to extrapolate, and I don't want to sort of cast one action as the, as the same as another or sort of riding my bike is the same as being William Wilberforce and abolitionist and all of this. But I do think those actions are places where we have the most personal connection to the crisis, right? So one, they're an introduction for us. If I look around and say, hey, I'm, I can't find a way of not consuming plastic for this particular product I buy or I can't find a way of biking to work that in itself that attempt right there's a chapter in the book where I talk about the one day I rode to work I still haven't done it again I might do one day but I, it was terrifying I nearly died um, <clears throat> but the act in itself was this really illuminating lesson in urban design because I was like holy crap like there's this great bike lane for 70 percent of the journey and then there's the last part where where I will die um, and which meant the bike lane for me was functionally useless, right? So those acts become teaching moments for ourselves. They become an opportunity to have those conversations with others, right? They're, they're becoming, you know, they're feeding into this conversation. So all of them, all of them are valuable, but I just think that they're not valuable in the way that we often get. I, I know friends, dear friends who are so fixated on their own footprint and their own negative impact that they're having and it just eats them up inside right and they're just like okay where can i shave off another three grams of carbon dioxide right and they're crawling around on their hands and knees corking the, the sideboards for the 15th time and um it, my argument is that that may not be their best use of time right now the counterpoint is there are people who really have reduced their carbon footprint far far further than i have and I think they have done the world a, a fabulous service. There's a book by a guy called Peter Kalmus, who I also interview in the book. He's a NASA scientist, climate scientist. Um, and he really has gone down that route of like, you know, he actually does poop in a bucket, right? And he does grow all his own vegetables and he refuses to drive a car. And he just des describes flying. I think he, he has a phrase like flying is like airplanes run on screaming babies or something he's, he's extreme in terms of his views of like the violence that fossil fuels inflict on the world um but his extremism influences my moderate effort right um and but, but i would argue the, the greatest value that he's had is in his writing his book and is in teaching other people and and when we spoke because we initially when i tried to set up an interview with him he has the same publisher as i do he was very reluctant to talk to me because he took my book title as being an argument for a de essentially a defense of hypocrisy. I think I was working with the title in, in, in defense of eco-hypocrisy. And he said he had no, no interest in defending hypocrisy, right? Um, and where we landed was actually we're in a very similar boat. We, we interpret it slightly differently, but he told me that um, where you want to be is slightly ahead of the curve. You go too far ahead of the curve and nobody can follow, right? So if you're really extreme right you're living in a yurt in the middle of the woods you're losing the possibility of influencing those who come behind you um and, and i'm sorry i'm talking a lot so i will wrap it up this is another question but um a, a, a very very close activist friend of mine passed away um last year i think but i talked to her as i was writing the book she just found out that she she said you think 2020 sucks i've got a geoblastoma um so was her first words to me when she called me Right. Um, and she was going through cancer treatment. She was a sort of permaculture, local food activist. Um, and we were talking about a lot of our friends who were living in the woods in Wales and chopping their own wood, and really trying to be self-sufficient. And she was like looking at these nurses that were giving her chemo treatment. And she was like, what am I going to like? I'm going to tell them to go live in the woods and grow radishes. Like, who's going to give me chemo? Right. 
there's a, there's a, there's this really essential recognition that that we are connected to everybody around us and if we're all doing the same thing we're not going to get anywhere right we've all got a role to play but finding that role anyway sorry i'm i, I see a, a hand raised uh that, is it chanan yeah that's that's him but my name's eden okay. actually <laughs> okay hey eden. Hi, Sammy, thank you so much for uh, being here and joining us tonight. Um, this has been wonderful. I have a question specifically related to your field. Uh, so I work in marketing. Um, so I've thought a lot about sort of the power that that industry holds um, and how historically that power has not been used for good in a lot of ways, um, but the opportunity to use sort of the power of marketing um, as a force for good. Um, and this kind of connects to Alice's question as well um, about sort of how to speak to people more generally. I imagine you've thought a lot about sort of using branding and marketing to kind of move forward, um, helping the climate crisis. Could you sort of share some of your thoughts on that? Sure. Yes. So, so for background, for years I ran a um, uh, an agency called the Change. Uh, we we worked with fair trade companies, um, solar companies, you know, nonprofits, that kind of thing. <coughs> and our our motto was the truth is your best tool. This was before the days that truth was quite so hard to pin down. I think so. I don't I don't know if I'd have the same motto now um, in the in the days of AI. Um, but I, it's a really trick, and I'm going to brag very briefly about this because I think it's a cool brag if you will forgive me so um ad week tells me that I invented a word um and that word is green hushing so if, if you all have heard of green washing right which is this idea of um green washing being um deceptive marketing practices right claiming to be greener than you are claiming to be more socially responsible than you are um you know being shell oil and saying you're a renewable energy company would class as green washing um, but there's this also this parallel phenomena that we're seeing where companies, entities and individuals don't want to talk about the good they're doing because they fear being accused of hypocrisy. Right. So <clears throat> I bring that up just as in this is sort of where where I've landed is like marketing. I do think the truth is your best tool, right? I think I, what I would love to see is marketing that is a little more nuanced and a little more sort of here is what we're doing and here is what we've still got to go, right? Here is, you know, here is our position where we're at right now. We can't turn this boat around overnight, right? We can't go from, you know, a, a, a fossil fuel economy to a non-fossil fuel economy tomorrow. But what we can do is say, here is our, like, here's our pathway to get in there. And there's lots of, like, cool initiatives doing that on the sort of policy and practice level in business, right? The science-based initiatives, you know, um, B Corp does a good job of this stuff um, and all of these folks. But then how you translate that into a simple message in marketing, because as you know, right, marketing is like dumb it down and then make it even dumber usually, right? Like how do we get to that sort of that place? I I don't have the answer, but I think there's some some cool cool opportunities for, for businesses to sort of own that and say, you know, I, I used to say it would be really nice if a fossil fuel company could do that. I, I'm not sure that's viable. I'm, I'm I'm very burned out on the idea that they're 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 reformable. Um, it doesn't seem you know having lived through BP becoming beyond petroleum, and I was I was the one arguing this is great, this is progress, and then like you know, and and then look what happened, right? Um, <clears throat> But I do think there are opportunities for, for most companies to really be honest and say, like, actually share the warts, right? Share the challenges, share the parts that are difficult. So the company I work for, it's been really interesting to say, you know, we've cut our office-based carbon footprint 90% very easily because everyone's working from home, right? We All we had to do is engineer a global pandemic and then, you know, kind of, kind of engineer a shift to telework and we were done. But the trouble is that we've got that other, you know, huge chunk of our footprint which is flying to ymcas jccs boys and girls clubs to do really important work on abuse prevention and drowning prevention and my boss is, keeps telling me he's like yes the climate crisis is a problem but we are not going to stop flying places and protecting kids so so what we've landed on is let's tell that story right and and, and be honest that there's this tension here right is that this is our carbon footprint over here and this is our mission which is to prevent children from being harmed how do you possibly balance the two? You you know, you can't as an individual company, you have to then engage with 
politics. You have to engage with policy and you have to do the best you can. I don't know if that's, that's helpful or not, but it's just, you know, the, the good news is it means there's lots of work for smart, intelligent, you know, people who who, who care about yeah. this stuff, right? Yeah, that was great. Right. Thank you. Yeah. I think, Becky, you had your hand raised. Yeah, but now I was trying to listen to you and hold my thought in my head, which didn't work. I, and I decided <laughs> listening to you was a better idea. <laughs> Um, I, but I, I, I the time. Say, <laughs> uh, to that last point, I think I've bumped into that once or twice and in unlikely places, the, okay. One of them came back to me. It's not exactly about climate, but Wells Fargo bank after its nightmare, um, just, just took that approach because it really couldn't do anything else other than go out of business if that's right. Um, <laughs> so, um, they, they have tried that line and I, I think the other one that I'm thinking of is Chevrolet because I ended up with a Chevy and we've never been Chevy people. And I it came with a magazine or something and I, 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 I'm not positive it's them, but I think I remember seeing them sort of say like, you know, here's, here's one thing we're trying to do or something. I don't know, whatever it was a little bit humble, you know? Um, but yeah. I, just, I do think it might be out there and it's important to keep our eyes open for it. Notice it when it's there and positively reinforce those examples. Um, one of the weird small things I do when I can't do what I think I ought to do, I call it plan B, you know, is like just call the company and ask them for what I want or call the company and tell them I noticed and I appreciate or whatever it is, you know, I just, yeah, because um, cause I, I don't think they, you know, talk about wondering if you're making a difference. Like sometimes I think they just sit there too and they think, Oh, 100%. My, my brother just connected me with a um, a friend of his who's a consultant for a large hotel chain. I forget which one, but essentially she heads up sustainability for one of these giant international hotel chains. And she, you know, she's responsible for all these initiatives on like reducing energy usage in the pools and whatever else. And she just said she can't get the company to talk about any of this stuff. They don't want to talk about it because they, you know, because they they fear that whatever they do, they're going to be knocked down and criticized and you know <clears throat> they, well, what it does it puts a target on their back for the things they're not yet doing which is also valid that's one of the reasons i actually like it to be honest with you as from an activist perspective i think it's helpful put more targets on your backs please because then if you know once you make a claim over here for you know x y or z and you claim to stand for these principles well then that's something that we can hold you to or at least try to hold you to um, one one of the campaigns we did with Dogwood Alliance, which I'm on the board of, this was before I was on the board. I was I did it as, through my branding agency. Was we took on Kentucky Fried Chicken for their paper and packaging policies, um, and we we spent years trying to think of like, and this is in the book too. But we 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 were trying to think of really intellectual arguments for why they should do better paper and packaging policies and all of this. And then at some point, my coworker was just like, well, what? Did, what if we just took the colonel and made him look like a, a bit of a jerk? I was like, yes, that's it, right? So we took the colonel, we put a chainsaw in his hand and put the, put him in front of a chopped down forest. And it worked incredibly effectively as a branding campaign because that's their single most important, you know, it's their single biggest asset. It's not their secret recipe because that's not that good, right? Um, <clears throat> but it, it they literally changed their paper and packaging policies. And through that, it changed the way that international pulp and paper managed forests across the entire Southeast United States, right? So there are these, <clears throat> there are these points of leverage. And the reason it, it resonated is because they claim to stand for, they didn't really claim to be a sustainable company, but they take claim to stand for southern heritage whatever that is and that's a whole thorny topic right but but they claim to stand for sort of you know traditional family values and good old you know sort of an amorphous fuzzy nice image and once you have that and you can hold on to it and say hold on this doesn't resonate with that well then they look at the 10 cents they were saving on paper versus the damage being done to their brand so anyway sorry i think it's a fascinating topic but probably bigger than i'm sorry there's another hand raised paul slash alice yes yes i i think i'm the alice part um i really think you're a very likable person sammy and and i and i think that your book is probably very fun to read i'm just convinced having trying to do my best for years now and 
and trying to to live in a way that's that I think is individually responsible has proven to me that individual responsibility can only go so far. And I am really very upset at having to hand this world that we've made to our grandchildren. And I'm not sure that I, I think your your book is very appealing, your manner is very appealing, your your positivity is very enticing. But I think our system is is ugly and corrupt and disgusting. And contrary to public health and the continuation of life on this planet. And that's a very painful thing to be thinking. Um, yeah. And I'm not sure that even shaming these corporations is going to work because we've all, we all know that they've known about the plastic and nanoparticles and in water that's that's in plastic bottles and although some of the stuff that's coming out now is is fairly new even to me it's just so our corrupt the the profit motive is so it 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 taps into what's worst about us animals us human animals and I don't, I, I am in despair about how we can approach turning around human proclivities. It's not going to be through our system. It's not, it, I would love it to be through Jewish values, for instance, but we don't seem to be getting there that way either. Um, I don't know. I don't know what to do with this. And I don't know where we're going, but I'm not happy. <laughs> I, well, thank you. And I, I think uh, the, let me see how I can answer that, because I think this, you, you raised some huge topics, right? And I think are absolutely right on, right? I hope nothing I'm saying comes across as an argument not to be righteously pissed off. Right, like uh, livid, furious, disappointed, depressed, like all of those things are utterly valid in the face of what we're facing. Um, in terms of how shame functions, just to answer that one sp specific point, uh, I do want to be clear is that, and, and this again is somewhat quoting the work of others, but the argument is not that we can use shame to get shell oil to suddenly see the light. Right. The argument is to use shame to shift what's politically possible in what we do with Shell Oil or what we do with Ford Motor Company or what we do with, you know, what we do with the Democratic Party and the Republican Party for that matter. Right. <coughs> so so these things, again, same to bring it back to the analogy of the um, the abolitionist case. Right. Is I don't think those boycotts suddenly turned around the the slaveholders and they said well i'm, I'm not going to do this anymore there might be individual cases where that happened i'm sure there are right people who said i can't work this job or i can't hold this wealth anymore but what happened was it opened up new political possibilities in terms of passing acts now there's obviously other dynamics going on too in terms of where we go like i'm with you in terms of at being at a loss and i'm in a different place to even when i wrote the book in terms of looking at what may happen you know looking how little or much, depending on your perspective, has been achieved in the last three years of, you know, a somewhat climate friendly government and what may happen at the next election. You know, the, there's you do know huge that, questions that, to grapple with. You do know that slavery continues. Oh, of um, course. Right. Of course. Yes. Um, not legally in this country, but it continues in this country and it continues across the world. 100%, so, yes. Um, I don't mean to be like the bummer of this of this gathering. This this gathering was a much happier gathering before I, I spoke. But um, I don't know where I'm going exactly with my comments. But I I do think that you know we had the era of the 
50 easy things you could do for the earth. And I, I feeling, I, I just have the suspicion. Let, let me say this. I do have the suspicion that it's going to take genuine catastrophe to change what we do. And it's not going to be fun. It's not going to be a matter of people can choose to become specialists in recycling and other people can choose to be specialists in solid waste management. I think it's going to be the case where people are going to have mass migration, mass loss, mass hunger, mass disease, mass, and then perhaps we won't have the goods to keep spend, spreading petroleum products all over the place. I don't know. Yeah. Well, I, I, for, I for one, you're not bringing me down, right? Like, I, okay. I think, um, I, I think what I would say is this, these, these are, when it comes to climate action, from my perspective, we've all got to find our theory of change, right? Or our most likely game out where we see the world going. And where I've landed on is a certain sense of humility is I have no bloody clue where we're going from here, right? I know we have the solutions to radically make a difference and make the world better. We have those available to us, whether we choose to use them or not, right? And I can see certain places where I can move the needle towards them being more available and more commonly used right that that's where i find i have power and, and and influence but what you're alluding to is that what i what where i choose to spend my time is going to be very different if i believe that it's possible that we can get to a place of sort of some form of reformed zero carbon capitalism versus somebody else over here who says actually i don't think that's possible and i think we're heading for a systems collapse and we need to plan for you know essentially community resilience and you know mass migration and you know sort of solidarity movements or whatever whatever it is that takes us to to the other side of that sort of more catastrophic scenario i think a lot of the ideas what, what i'd say is a lot of the ideas that i'm trying to present are applicable to both scenarios but what you end up doing with them is going to be radically different right because if you think of yourself even in that because you seem like a person who what you seem like you are, you are clearly a person who cares deeply about morality about humanity even if you're disappointed in it right um and about society now what i would say is that where you wh what you see in terms of your likely outcomes and scenarios what's your role in making that better right if you have one and if you choose to accept it Right, because it's also it maybe it's like, hey, I'm washing my hands. I've been working on this for fifty years, and screw all of y'all. Right, I think is also a valid response sometimes, you know. But uh, but I think the 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 only position that I would argue that I have any authority to argue on is just to think of yourself is to shift your perspective from my individual role into what my role is in the collective, and then from there it's really on you to say like, hey, I I view it as a likely apocalyptic or semi-apocalyptic scenario still that idea of connection ecosystem sort of approach to my actions is still important within that scenario right and if you happen to be more of a sort of green capitalist we can design our way out of this like you know all of that it's applicable over here so, so, so to some degree each of us has to look at the, the available evidence and say like hey what's my best guess, right? And it's always going to be a guess. It's always going to be a sort of, like 10 years ago, I was writing for Tree Hugger and we were just going to, we were going to design our way out of this problem, right? Design and shop our way out of this problem. That's what we were going to do. And and it felt like we were making some progress, right? So like, bikes are trendy, you know? <laughs> hey, everyone's got a reusable coffee cup, right? <laughs> and I'm embarrassed to think of a lot of the stuff we wrote back then, right? I'm probably somewhere in between I'm not at the sort of staring down the apocalypse yet, but I'm certainly with you on a lot of a lot of your critiques of like, it really doesn't feel like we can turn this around. And it doesn't even feel like we're having conversations on a societal level. We know that this crisis is happening. We're looking at it and saying, you know, science is awful, right? We know the cause of it and we know what we could be doing. And yet we're over here arguing about, you know, some made up controversy over, you know, whatever, I won't, I won't get into politics, but... <laughs> Um, I, I, I don't know if that 
it helps at all, Alex. I, I don't, I certainly don't want to dismiss your view of the world because a lot of people share it. And in my, you know, I, I have no authority to say you're not right. You, you know, there's plenty of evidence to, there's a lot of evidence to say you're absolutely right. I happen to be sort of a, my personality wise, I'm a glass half full kind of person. And I find focusing on those catastrophic scenarios for me is very unmotivating. Like when I'm in that space, I'm like, I can't do shit. I'm going to sit around and drink whiskey, you know? Um, but that that's, that's how I respond to that kind of, um, uh, the, the sort of more catastrophic scenarios I can't even wrap my head around um partially because I I, I don't know what I would do right I'm not I'm not going to survive an apocalypse like I write for a living I, I can barely change a light bulb <coughs> but uh, does, does that make sense right like it's yes you know. it does I think I, you know, I, you're not, the name of your book is not how to save humanity from the climate oh. crisis. You yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. And I, and I get that. And I appreciate that. And I think more, more talk perhaps about how we can act collectively, because I think the genius of our, of our culture and our capitalistic system and even the systems in this world that are not capitalistic, is that they make it very difficult to act collectively, to change. Right. For, for, for a good reason, right? They they want they want to make it difficult. They want to frame it. As, there's a there's a very good reason why they want it. They're happy talking about carbon footprints because that's breaking us down into the smallest possible units of action. You know. Sorry, I was talking over you. But... I'll, I'm actually going to pause this if I can, just because we we've. A bit exceeded the time um, oh. that we asked of you, Sammy. Um, though I appreciate your generosity, just openness, oh, just a really um, a wonderful conversation um, that struck, you know, kind of struck a lot of um, emotional and um, intellectual notes. Um, and I just appreciate also getting to hear from everyone else here in our community. Um, I will note um, that we do have, I think, ten copies of the book coming to. Um, the gift shop, but also possibly getting distributed out. I'm not sure that the gift shop necessarily was going to hold all of them, or some might just be sort of a lending library. Um, so if we, if you are eager for more, um, more Sammy's on the way. Um, I was just, I, I was just catching up on the chat, and I was just going to second Ministry of the Future is a really interesting book to read, and and actually Alice, it gets it, it, it's um it's a great book for the topic we just discussed. Ministry of the Future. It's a, if you enjoy speculative fiction, um, but also twenty New York twenty one forty by the same author, yeah, in yeah. Stanley Robinson, because it you know you, it ends with them building a, a a cooperative movement. Yeah, yeah, largely anything by him is as far as I've come across is you know read my well, book first and then that. Yeah, I was going to say that's not how we're supposed <laughs> to end here. Is you. Um... <laughs> you know, pitching other people's books. But seriously, thank you so much, Sammy. It's been thank really you. fun to get to connect with you. And and a big thank you to Rabbi Woodward for finding your book at your local bookshop. Yeah, yeah um, this is. I'm excited that you were down the road. Like I said, like if you're in town again, Dane's Place, I will buy you a beer or a beverage of your choice. Awesome. I'd love to meet up. That, that'd be yeah. great. I'll be um, back and, in spring. Perfect. And then and, and to all of you all, though, if you're working on this in the synagogue and stuff, I'd love to hear about like the projects you're working on. Just, you know, drop me an email and keep me posted on on the work because I'm really appreciative of you know this has been one of the most fun events I've done actually in terms of book stuff. Um so a lot of good people. Thank you so so much. This was great. Thank you. Well have a good evening everybody and stay warm. Yeah. Bye. Thank you, Bye, Sammy. Everyone. Bye friends. <laughs>